Hey everyone, and welcome to this month's live event with Nikki LaFoyle. She is once again back to answer all of your sewing questions. Again, if you are just tuning in, if this is your first time catching a live event, you can ask questions uh, for the next hour live by typing those into the um, box underneath this video and she'll work through as many as she can. Um, but of course, if you don't catch this, we are always available to answer other questions on social media and our website um, at any given time. So thank you so much for being here, Nikki, and we will start with a question right away from Peggy. And Peggy wants to know, what brand of shears do you prefer? I have tried several different Fiskars and all of them have snagged on the fabric. Help! I am tired of spending good money on bad shears. Yes. Well. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, yes, there's nothing more frustrating than spending good money on something and then it just doesn't work for you. So um, if your your shears are snagging, um, you can try to get them sharpened or try to sharpen them yourself if you have one of those sharpening tools. But I was recently gifted a pair of Ginger scissors. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Ashley and I were just talking about the pronunciation. Um, I think it's Ginger, but um, they're the really they're heavy. They're um, just you know silver metal, and they cut just like a dream. They're amazing. Um, so that is what I would recommend. I've only been using them for a, a year or two now, but um, still cutting just as sharp as ever. Absolutely. And I think like we were saying, we don't exactly know how to pronounce them, but if you were to go to a fabric store and ask for a high-end pair of shears, they're silver, they are usually come in a fancy box. I think any fabric store would know exactly what it is you're talking about. Definitely. Yep. Um, as far as sharpening, if you did or have a pair of shears like those, a, a higher-end pair of shears, would you sharpen those yourself or would you take those somewhere and have them sharpened? Um... That is a good question. I don't know how um, how costly it is to take it to a professional, have them professionally sharpened. Um, and I've never tried to sharpen a pair myself. So um, handling something like your good pair of shears, it might be best to go to a professional, depending on you know the cost of it and um, and you know investing in your the longevity of your shears. Absolutely. All right, we have a, another question here. This is, cause could be the same Peggy or maybe a different Peggy, I'm not sure. But she says, how do I move thread from one bobbin to another? I ordered pre-wound bobbins in various colors and then realized the bobbins wouldn't work on my machine. I won't do that again. Um, yeah, so I believe you should be able to move the thread from one bobbin to another just as you would wind a bobbin from a spool of thread. So just put your bobbin on the, the thread spool and you know thread it around your new bobbin and hit the foot pedal and it should just wind it off onto your new bobbin. Absolutely. Or you can use a bobbin winder and guess what? We have a video on National Sewing Circle on how to use a bobbin winder um, and that way it's, it's just a little freestanding bobbin winder so if you don't want to do it like at your machine you can just take this and you know sit and watch TV and do all of your bobbins all at once and it, it works the exact same way. Um, there's a little diagram on there that shows you how to wind the thread around the new bobbin coming from the old one or the spool of thread and super easy to use. So definitely an option there. All right, our next question here, this is from Sam, and she wants to know, what do you recommend using as a makeshift thimble if someone, such as me, lost theirs and keeps being too lazy to go buy another one? Um, well, this has happened to me when I just could not find my thimble in my mess of a sewing room. Um, just take um, some leather or faux leather or a couple of layers of fabric like denim and put it over your thumb and I just keep, you know, keep that at my side and just pull it up when I need to use it. Um, some people have like, you can wrap it around your thumb and like tape it if you are gonna be using it a lot to just kind of rig something up until you can get a new one. And it works just fine to use, you know, a couple layers of fabric that you've got. Handy. Absolutely. And I mean, if all else fails, just some duct tape. I don't you know. Right? <laughs> All right, this next question here, this is from Maggie, and she says, the bobbin sizes is an issue. I also got pre-wound bobbins, but they bounce all around. How do I know what size to get? 
Yeah. So um, I don't know why they don't just make all bobbins the same. That's so silly. I at, at one point I've had like a couple different size bobbins rattling around in my drawer and I had to keep like checking them to make sure I was putting the right one in the right machine. Um, so your, your sewing machine manual should tell you what size bobbin to use. Um, and if it does not, or if you can't find it in your manual or you don't have your manual, you can type in your, uh, your brand and your model of machine, type it into your search bar and, um, uh, and type in like bobbin size with that. And that should bring up, if not the, you know, the official answer, probably sewing forums where people have asked the same question. And you can read through the thread on the sewing forum and probably find the answer. And then if you're ordering, um, when you're ordering bobbins on Amazon or whatever website you're ordering from, a lot of times they will say in the specs, I mean, obviously they should say what size so you can match that up. But a lot of times they'll also say fits Bach machines or fits, you know, whatever, whatever brand of machine. So that is helpful when they say that. So make sure you read through the product specs on the, on that page too. And as far as you know, are uh, bobbins like brand specific? So like one bobbin will fit all Fof or are they like model specific also? Or, or do you know? Um, in in my experience, they have been brand specific. Um, so a, a bobbin from a brother would fit another brother. A bobbin from a fof would fit another fof. But you can't use Husqvarna Viking bobbins on anything else. Um, well, but the good thing about those, and this is the because I have a Viking and I also have a fof and a brother and a singer. But so the the Viking is the only one that the bobbins are green. Like they're the only ones I've ever gotten a different color. Bobbins. Yeah. At least, at least they're easy to tell apart. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next question here. This is from Laginska, and they say, "Why can I only find stiff cotton fabrics at my fabric store? It's hard to make anything with that." It is. Yeah. Um, so a lot of fabric stores are. The majority of it is just quilting cottons. Like you go into your Joanne Fabrics, and it's rows and rows of quilting cottons. Um, and the fabric that, um, you know, wound on bolts, it, it does feel stiff in the store and it will soften up a little bit when you take it home and wash it because it's got the, you know, the leftover dye and the chemical coating from the factory to protect it during shipping and, you know, sitting on the shelf. So once you wash it, all of that will, will go away and it will, um, get a little bit softer, but um, the regular, you know, plain weave quilting cotton is, is good for a lot of things, quilts and purses and home decks and, you know, some shirts and skirts. But if you're trying to make something that you want a little more drape to, um, in like softer folds, you will want something different from quilting cotton. So, um, you can branch out into, if your fabric store has different sections, you can... Um, check out if they have, you know, if you're looking for something different, they have a home deck section. That's where they'll have the leathers and faux leathers and, you know, uh, faux furs and fleece burlap, which are great for a lot of different things. Um, but you can also like call around to different fabric stores to see what they've got, you know, what kind of selection they have. Um, and if you can't physically find something that specifically that you're looking for in a store, a physical store, you can always go online. Um, you can buy whatever you want from the internet. Um, and in addition to like the, the wholesale fabric, um, fabric websites like fabric.com and uh, fashionfabricsclub.com where they just pull from the manufacturers and sell you that fabric. You can also go directly to the manufacturer's website and find their fabric a lot of times, maybe for cheaper. Um, so like cottonandsteelfabrics.com, um, Cloud9, the number nine fabrics, it's a, um, good for quilting cottons. Um, and shopping online for fabric is scary. 
Um, I, I don't like doing it. Um, I like to, you know, feel the fabric in my hands and like drape it all over myself in the aisle to see how what how it's going to kind of behave before I buy it. And online, you know, it's hard to see like the color, you know, what true color it is on your screen and the, the pattern repeat and everything. It's kind of difficult. But um, a lot of times, you know, if you're looking for something specific, you may have to take that leap and um, try ordering it. Um, without touching it and having it in your hands. Um, but once you you take that leap and if you find a, you know a certain fabric from a certain manufacturer that you know is going to work, then you can go back there. I just got there with um, cotton and steel fabrics. I got some of their rayon. They have a, in addition to all of their quilting cottons that they have, they have a ton. They also have a, a line of rayon and they have like lawn and they sell a whole bunch of things so they're great but their rayon is amazing it's just buttery soft and smooth and drapey so i made the leap the first time and ordered the rayon kind of not really knowing how it was going to be but it was great so i've gotten that um twice again now that i i know what i'm getting and i know what to expect um but so you can shop around online um and get anything you want. Um, WyndhamFabrics.net is another great website. I've gotten fabric from them. They do a lot of quilting cottons, but they do have like tons and tons and tons of great prints. So that's W-I-N-D-H-A-M Fabrics.net. Um, they are great. And I mentioned FashionFabricsClub.com. They sell a lot of different things. I got some velvet from them. That was great. And they have great prices too. Um, so yeah, if you, if you can't, you know, shop around and find something, find what you're really looking for specifically, physically, you can always venture online and, and good luck. Absolutely. So out of all of those that you've mentioned, um, the only one that I've actually used personally is fabric.com. Um, and I order actually a lot of faux leather and stuff from there. And I know you can order, um, before you actually say order how much you need, you can, you can get a sample swatch and they will sometimes they're anywhere from like 10 cents to a dollar depending on the fabric, but they will just send you, um, you know, a square or whatever of that fabric. So are, do, do you know if some of the other ones do that as well? So you can actually see the color and stuff before you, you know, buy 10 yards of it? Yes, that is a really good point. Buying a, a sample swatch is great. Um, the only other website that I have gotten sample swatches from is actually Mood Fabrics, which I think is moodfabrics.com. Or if you just type in Mood Fabrics into your search bar, the the actual website will come up. So they do that as well. And I think their sample swatches, depending on what fabric it is, it the um, the price is different, but it was like a dollar fifty to three dollars per swatch. And they were like five inch squares or something. They were pretty good size. Gotcha. Good. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right, next question here. This just came in. This is from Pat. And they say, how do you know the best thread to use for fabrics? And also, how often should I change my needle on my sewing machine? I love answering this question. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you for asking that, Pat. Um, so how often should you change your machine, or change your needle on your machine? Um, that's a question for the ages, you know. Everybody's got... Um, everybody their recommended value. Right, everybody has their recommended value. Um, uh, I have heard um, you should change, oh my gosh, what what was it, every six hours of sewing? Yeah, like six to eight hours of sewing, I think is what, if you were to, if you were to Google it, I feel like that's the most recognizable answer. Yeah. Yep, so that's like the general, you know, pass down knowledge, six to eight hours on a needle. But I always change my needle between projects. I just do. It's easier for me to remember. And so there's a caveat. You can't just say every six hours change your sewing, change your needle. Because if you're sewing on fleece, if you're sewing on full leather, if you're sewing through paper, interface a lot of interfacing, if you're sewing through uh, batting, and especially the batting that has those metal like metallic flecks in it, it's the the, the insulbright. 
in, yeah, and so right, the insulated batting. That will dull, all those things will dull your needle quicker. So after two, even two hours, two to three hours of sewing, just you want to um, just pay attention to your needle, especially when you're sewing things like that or when you know your needle is getting to the end of its life. Just pay attention. If you start getting um, uh, skip stitches, thread nests, tension issues are a lot of times a result of a dull needle. So you just need to change your needle. Um, if you hear when the needle is going through the fabric, if you hear bunk, 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 or if your fabric is kind of doing this when the needle is going through it, that's called flagging. That is a symptom of a dull needle. Just change your needle and that'll take care of that. Um, so yeah, after every project, um, you know, sometimes it's probably only two hours of sewing on quilting cotton or rayon and I'll change my needle just because I have to get into the habit of that or I'll forget. And that's just an easy time to, to say, okay, finish that project, get a new needle. See, and you're, you're, you're good about that. I guess I am so the opposite. Um, like my, when the needle stops working, that's kind of when I change it. Like it's just, I kind of, and I pin cushion this specifically for what I call trash needles. And so those are ones that are, I'm going to say two dolls where I'm definitely getting skip stitches if I'm sewing through layers of cotton and stuff, but I'm going to keep it just in case I ever am like practicing something on paper and I just need, you know, like a throwaway needle. So, I mean, I probably, I mean, I will absolutely push the needle as far as it can go. Cause I figure why not? Like as long as it's still working, I mean, maybe, maybe I have 10 to 12 hour needles. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> push it, get every yeah. last stitch you can out of those needles. <laughs> exactly. All right. And then her first part of the question was how you know the best thread to use for your fabrics. Right. So, um, an all purpose thread is going to work great for you. 99% of the time. Um, when you start wanting to look at different types of thread is when you're using some different fabrics like um, well if you ever want to top stitch something I like top stitching on faux leather when I'm making bags and the top stitch thread um, is just a little bit thicker so that it stands out more you get more of that top stitching look um, and incidentally you'll want to use a top stitching needle for that it has a larger eye to allow that thread to slip through the eye without creating extra friction and tension if you've got a smaller eye um, if you are sewing on like a silk or uh, a really thin, fine chiffon or um, or something like a, even a lining fabric like an acetate, something that is really thin and fine, you might want to use a fine thread. That's really just what it's called is fine thread or it might be called lightweight thread or something like that. It's just thinner. Um, so it'll lie nice and smooth on your thin fabric. Um, they make metallic thread, which is cool to do. Um, you can do bobbin work with it and kind of some fun things. Um, um, well, specifically, yeah. I know we get a lot of questions about knit fabric. What would you, what thread would you use for that? Good question. Um, knit fabric, you want to use all-purpose thread or polyester thread. You just don't want to use cotton thread on knit fabric because cotton thread does not have any give to it. And all-purpose thread is a uh, cotton-wrapped polyester core thread. So it's got that, that polyester core and polyester has uh, a little bit of give, a little bit of stretch. So it'll move with the knit fabric a little bit better. Um, and there's also silk thread, which um, is also very fine and thin, but also very strong. So whenever you're sewing on silk, use silk thread um, because it will it'll wear the same as the fabric. It'll wash the same as the fabric. And typically, you want to do that uh, if you can match the the thread fiber content to the fabric fiber content, so everything will wear and wash the same. But those are just your um, general rules for the main types of thread. Absolutely. All right. The next question here, this is from Terry and they want to know how can I begin to learn sewing? Where do I start? 
that is um, that's why we're all here. You know, how how do I learn sewing? Um, well, it um, I always recommend starting out by reading your sewing machine manual so that you are familiar with your machine. You kind of know physically how it works. You know how to thread it. Um, and just like play around with it, sew some straight stitches, press all the buttons, see what they do. You're not going to break anything by pressing all the buttons. And if any of your settings get messed up, you just turn it off and turn it back on and it'll go back to the, the default settings anyway. Um, so play around with it, um, see what it'll do. Sew some, sew all your, test out all your, your uh, built-in stitches. Um, and then I always recommend um, when you're going out there searching for sewing knowledge to learn, stick with one or two trusted sources to begin with. Um, it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of information out there. Anyone with a computer can start a sewing blog and um, so there, there's a lot of information getting thrown at you. So start with one or two trusted sources, obviously nationalsewingcircle.com. They have a lot of great short videos that are very informative, and I always find that videos are a great way to learn. I have a really hard time just reading something and looking at pictures and knowing what they're talking about, so I, I like videos. I like hands-on visual learning. That's how I learn best. Um, so National Sewing Circle has a lot of videos, but also... Um, sewnews.com has a lot of great content even if you don't get the physical magazine they have uh, every month they have you know free projects and free patterns and um, under the the sew news umbrella sew it all tv.com and sew it all mag.com uh, sew it all magazine was designed and you know targeted to beginners so just learning how to sew is a lot of um, you know kind of small easier projects so that is a great place to learn, to start learning. They have um, free projects and free patterns on there as well. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, noodle around on your machine, and then when you're ready to start doing projects, you can seek some of those things out and just um, start small and and build up. Absolutely. And just to, to plug, of course, a few more of the classes that we have on National Sewing Circle, um, I like to say we do have a bunch of free videos that are very simple. You know, how do I use my machine? How do I thread my machine? How do I get started? We also have um, videos on there specifically for how do you teach children sewing? And that's also a good way to you yourself learn how. Um, some fun ideas like actually printing off a maze and sewing through a maze that teaches you how to turn corners and things like that. Um, and then of course both Nikki and I have both done some beginner, intermediate, and sort of advanced your sewing skills type classes. Um, so there's so many um, resources and, and things out there that you can definitely find something and start learning how to sew. All right, so we got a few questions that came in here at once. We're gonna follow up with this one from Maggie talking about fabric. Can you address the bamboo and cork we see being used? Um, yeah, so they're making fabric from bamboo, which is awesome. Um, I think um, Tencel is the name that comes to mind. I think that is probably just a brand. Um, and they, you know, different brands will have bamboo fabric as well. But I have sewn with Tencel fabric and it's, it feels amazing. It's uh, more sustainable than uh, other man-made fabrics uh, because bamboo grows like crazy fast, and you know they make making fabric out of it is really cool. So it was a really soft, drapey fabric, um, and um, it was it was great. Um, what thread did you use sewing with it? Since that's what we were talking about. Um, I think I just used an all-purpose, but if you have any problems with that, just probably go with something a little bit lighter, like a fine thread. Um, but I think I just used an all-purpose thread. Um, it felt kind of like a rayon, and I think there's some special considerations when washing it that you might have to look up, um, like washing cold water and 
hang dry or something like that. But um, you'd want to look that up. So that is really cool. It's very expensive, still a, a little more expensive than other fabrics. Um, but hopefully as that starts, as they start making more of it and as it starts catching on, hopefully the price will come down a little bit. Um, but as for cork, I have never, I have not actually even seen a cork fabric. I've never sewn on something like that. Um, but that would be neat too. I'm going to have to Pinterest that later. I'm sure I'll find yeah. something on there because I'm, I'm also curious. <laughs> All right, next question here. This is from Kay. This is a little bit different of a question that we've ever gotten, but she says, hi, Nikki. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What kind of sewing do you like to do? How long have you been sewing? What are your favorite fabrics to sew? And do you sew for children? And this last one, do you teach sewing? Of course, she teaches sewing for us, a national sewing circle. But you get to answer the rest of those. Okay, that's such a nice question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I teach here from through National Sewing Circle. I also write for Sew News Magazine, so you'll see some articles in the magazine, some projects I've designed and written instructions for. Um, and I do, in addition to these live videos, I do some longer form videos um, on NationalSewingCircle.com. Uh, I've been sewing since I was about 11 years old, so that's uh, 18 years now. Um, I've been sewing, um, and I started out, you know, my grandmother taught me how to sew a little bit, but I was mostly on my own, just kind of winging it with a, a hand sewing needle and thread, mostly until I went to college and learned how to use a machine. Um, but I like to sew garments. That's been my favorite. Um, in high school, I sewed some prom dresses, um, so that's kind of, uh, my background, how I got started in, um, in garments. Um, well, and just I, because I know you, I've heard you tell this story before. What was the first ever garment you ever sewed and why did it not fit you once you finished it? <laughs> so I feel like it was a, it was a common mistake <laughs> to make. <laughs> uh, I, for some reason, I was like 12 or 13 and I thought, I'm going to sew a pair of pants. Like, one of the harder things to try and, you know, pick up and sew. And I had never used a pattern before. I had no idea like what a pattern was. So I was just like cutting out pieces of fabric and like trying to patchwork them together <laughs> and make it work as pants. And um, so I measured and cut out these pieces, but I cut the pieces like to my measurements and didn't leave any ease or anything. So it was like, I was able to get my legs in them, and also I used quilting cotton fabric, which was a really the bad. The coolest idea. pants ever are made from quilting cotton. <laughs> it was a cool print. I think I probably bought that fabric at a garage sale. It's like this is great. It's a it's a great print. It'll be great pants. Um, but yeah, uh, I could get them on my body. I just couldn't move at all. So it was a little bit of a disaster. But I learned a lot from sewing those. So I don't regret it. <laughs> I learned a lot. Every mistake is a learning opportunity. Um, but my favorite fabric to sew, my favorite fabric has been rayon since, actually it's only been a couple of months that I've been sewing rayon. I was always, you know, quilting cotton for everything, but or quilting cotton or knits, uh, but rayon, you get the, the drape and the feel that you get a lot of times with knits, but it's a little bit less uh, tricky to sew than knits. And rayon just has its own unique feel to it. And it's it's been my favorite. Um, Perfect. The only other one, do you sew for children? I know you've sewn a little bit for your daughter. Um, I have sewn her some skirts. But I don't really do much more than that. She grows so fast. It's crazy. So I just do skirts that she can kind of grow with. And then she has so many clothes anyway. I don't bother really making her any. Gotcha. Speaking of skirts, um, you have a class on our uh, website where you do show several different ways to put elastic waistbands into skirts. So um, I cannot remember the name of the class off the top of my head. Um, I believe it is your intermediate sewing skills. I, I think so. That was the intermediate one. So in addition to the the elastic, talking about talk a lot about elastics and inserting elastic into waistbands. I talk about 
a whole pile of other things. Um, probably like, like binding and mitering corners, I think, mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. Absolutely, like two hours worth of um, intermediate sewing skills. So definitely a good one. If you consider yourself a beginner, not quite advanced, but you want to get there, that's definitely a class to consider taking. All right, our next question here, this is from Maureen, and she says, is there really a shelf life for thread? Does it weaken with time or lack of proper storage? Yes. So um, mostly it's improper storage that will weaken your thread. If your thread has been kept properly, it'll last, I mean, 50, 60, I don't know a whole pile of years but if you leave your thread in the sunlight if you store it in a, a damp humid atmosphere that's going to weaken your thread and you'll the thread will break when you're trying to use it and it'll just kind of disintegrate so make sure you keep your thread away from sunlight and in um, a cool dry place um, I Totes are a great place to store thread if you're going to be storing them for a while. Um, little airtight containers are great to just protect them from humidity. Um, so yeah, if you treat your thread right, it'll last. It'll last you a long time. Absolutely, and I think we we've talked about this a little bit before too. Say if you you know go to a garage sale and you pick up some old thread and maybe you don't know how it's been stored or kept. Um, there is something called Sewer's Aid, it's a thread conditioner, and you can just put that on the thread and it sort of works its way in and uh, brings that thread sort of back to new. Um, to something you could use, like I said, if, if you're not sure the thread you're using, how it was stored before. All right, our next question here, this is from Philomena, and they say, when I am using a sewing needle for mending, how do I mark it so I know when to replace it? Right now, I just use it until I start hearing ticking noises or it breaks. Sounds like me. Do you have any ideas for me? I love your program and hope it runs for a long time. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so when I have to change my needle, um, if I have only used a needle for for like an hour or something, and I have to switch it for a dip, if I'm using a different fabric or whatever, um, I will just put it in – I actually put it in a piece of paper – which may not be great, but I then I write on the paper next to it what size it is, what needle it is, and how long it's been used. And I just keep that little piece of paper in my sewing box. I know um, if you like have a, a big tomato pin cushion, you can put it in there and write even write on your pin cushion. Um, and there's a product I forget who the manufacturer is, but it's this um, probably Schmetz. Um, it's this little okay. pad. Yeah. Uh, it's a pad where it's got like the different sections for different kinds of needles. And you can put your needles in that um, if you've only used them. And that way you can keep track of what needle it is and how long you've been using it. So, but I use the, the cheap method of a piece of paper and just writing on it. That's true. I just, I envision like when you sew, you have like a, a chess clock and you like start a timer so you know how long <laughs> you've been sewing on a certain needle. Like that's just what I envision every time you talk about, you know, using it for a couple hours. But maybe yeah. I'm, I don't know. There, it's, there's a lot of estimating that going, that goes on because I don't, I don't sit down and sew for an hour at a time. I sit down and sew a little bit and then I have a three and a half year old daughter so I can't sit down and do anything for more than like a half hour at a time. Um, so it's just your best guess as to how long you've been using your needle. It doesn't have to be an exact science. Perfect. All right, our next question here, um, Amanda would like some machine embroidery tips. Machine embroidery tips. So whenever we're talking about machine embroidery, my main tip is to try to match your stabilizer weight to the weight of the fabric you are embroidering. So if you're embroidering something a little thicker, like a denim or something, you might want to do like a cutaway stabilizer. Um, so there's a couple different main types of stabilizers. The cutaway stabilizer is a little thicker and stiffer, and when you're done embroidering, you cut it away from the wrong side of the design. And then you've got the tearaway stabilizer, which is a little bit thinner. That's my go-to. It's what I always use, you know, for 
for quilting cottons, for most things it's great for. And if you have a fabric that's a little bit thicker, you can use actually two layers of that to um, kind of make it a little bit, give it more stabilization for the fabric. Um, and then when you're done, it like perforates the stabilizer, the needle perforates the stabilizer, tear it away from the wrong side and you're done. Um, there's a water soluble stabilizer, um, which comes in like a film, film type variety and also a more fabric-y type variety. And when you're done embroidering on that, you use water to just, it just, it dissolves. It's pretty cool. It's great for things like, um, like a lightweight jersey knit um, because it's a lighter stabilizer and it dissolves from the wrong side so you don't have that stabilizer like against your skin when you're wearing it. Um, and then there's a heat removable stabilizer which is very thin like the water soluble stabilizer and it will dissolve completely from under the threads. You just use heat to remove it which is cool. Um, and my other tip is when you are embroidering on something that has a pile like a terry cloth or um, velvet, faux fur, anything that's got a pile that sticks up, float a piece of water soluble or heat removable stabilizer over the top, something that's got uh, in the film variety, so something just very lightweight. Just float it over the top of your fabric, stitch your design, and then use water or heat to remove it completely from the design. That just um, it, it stabilizes the threads almost. It helps uh, kind of lift the threads up from the pile so that the threads don't sink down into that pile. So you don't get, you know, the terry cloth pile sticking up through the threads. And so the design doesn't like sink down and get kind of devoured by those, uh, that pile. Um, so yeah, those are my, my main machine embroidery. So by float, you just mean set it, don't pin it, or do you go ahead and pin it? Um, you can pin it or tape it outside of the the embroidery area. Um, yeah, okay. just to get it on there. Perfect. Just in case people aren't, you know, up to date on machine embroidery lingo, which yeah. I <laughs> I don't know why they call it floating it over. That's just always what I've heard it called to just put the topper over. I don't know. I like it. It sounds good. All right, our next question here, this is from Verna, and she would like to know, where do you find the latest sewing gadgets? Um, so sewing gadgets, um, I always buy everything on Amazon.com, but I always know exactly what I'm looking for. So I'll type it into Amazon. Most of the time they have it. Um, but I, I'll, sh like, shop around to different, like, fabric sites and different, you know, notion sites and see if I can get a, a good price on it. But if you're just like looking for what's new and what's cool, um, dritz.com, they sell a lot of cool sewing notions. You can keep an eye on their, their shop. And then Nancy's notions.com. I know they have a shop too. Um, but other than that, I don't really know any specific sites to go to, to look for sewing gadgets. So if, if any viewers have any go-to sites, type them in and then we can share that with everyone. Absolutely, or if anyone has any suggestion on like what the latest like sewing gadget is, I would love to hear it too, because like I, I think I'm, I don't use a whole lot of, I guess, gadgets. I think for years I didn't even know there was an actual like point turning tool. I just assumed you used your scissors or a pencil or whatever. <laughs> so it's like, if you, if you, you either use a lot of gadgets, I think, or you don't. So yeah, if, say, if people have, you know, their favorite gadget out there, I definitely love to hear what they are. <laughs> All right. Our next question here, this is from Candy and she wants to know what is the difference in seam binding tapes used on knit fabrics? So seam binding tape. So I'm not entirely sure if it, you mean uh, like bi bias binding to bind an edge? Or when I hear the word tape for knits, I think of like twill tape to stabilize shoulder seams. Um, so um, stabilizing shoulder seams in knits will just help them, keep them from stretching out and everything. So you can use twill tape for that. Uh, twill tape is just like a thin like quarter inch tape 
that is woven in a twill weave, like your, your denim jeans are woven in a twill weave. Um, and you just sew that right into the seam, stabilizes, um, uh, not between the fabric layers, but on the wrong side of the fabric so that um, on, on top of the wrong side of the fabric so it doesn't show from the right side. Um, so you can use twill tape for that. Uh, I know in college I have a memory of using like a like a clear like plastic almost. Uh, I don't know what that was, but honestly, I think you can use anything like a stabilizer even, cut a strip of stabilizer and sew it into the seam. I actually just came upon this today. Sorry if that's backward, my camera's, it's good, that's good. Um, that's a fusible tape made specifically for knit seams. So specifically for stabilizing knits, shoulder seams, zipper areas, um, hems, things like that. So there are specific things also that you can use for that. Um, infusible, that's kind of cool, keep it in place. Um, but honestly, I think you can use just any kind of stabilizer, interfacing, cut a strip, sew it into your seam to uh, stabilize those seams. Um, but if you meant binding, um, when you're binding knit edges, um, I like to make my own binding. Uh, the, the Wrights brand binding that they sell at the store only comes in a couple of colors and it's polyester. So I know a lot of quilters don't really like to use it because it's a lot of times it's not going to wash the same as your garment. Um, so whenever you can, I just always recommend using the, the, the fabric to create your own binding or a fabric of the same fiber content to coordinate. Um, and when you're doing knits, you don't really, uh, you don't actually have to do it on the bias because knit has a stretch anyway. Um, unless you're using a knit that's like a, a thicker knit, like a double knit that doesn't have a lot of stretch, then you might want to do it on the bias anyway, especially if you're going around a curve like a neckline or an arm's eye. Um, but yeah, I always like to use, cut my strips of the same fabric to make sure everything's going to uh, mesh well together. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, this is from Tanya, and she says, do you use stabilizer when doing free motion embroidery? Um, um, yeah, I, I would. Um, so free motion embroidery, like free motion quilting? I said that's the only type of free motion stitching that I've ever done, and so it's not necessarily stabilizer, but you have your you know quilt sandwich and you have batting and backing fabric, so it's stabilized. Right. Yeah, I think the batting sandwich is all the stabilizer you need for that fabric. It'll support those threads if you're doing your, your free motion in a quilting sense. So, but say you wanted to do some, like, just free motion stitching, maybe on, like, uh, something you're going to put on a shirt pocket and you want to maybe, I don't know, write a name or something. Uh, how would you stabilize that? Um, I would... Um, Test it out first. You may not need stabilizer. Um, but if your fabric is like kind of shifty and you're going to be moving it all around, you may want a stabilizer. So it depends on like how you're doing it. If you, um, if it's on a pocket and you want, if, if leaving the stabilizer in it makes it too stiff for the garment, you may want to use a tearaway stabilizer so that it's not, you know, you use it to stabilize the fabric as you're stitching, but then you don't need it anymore. Tear it away or use the water soluble for heat removal like I was talking about to take it away so that it's not making that stiff when you're wearing it. So there's a lot of, of factors that, that play into that decision. Um, but um, stabilizing something is is always a good idea. You know, err on the side of caution there. It will keep your fabric um, protected and keep it looking crisp and nice. So um, yeah, test it out. It, it you know it depends on your specific scenario, but test that out. Absolutely. 
All right, the next question here, this is from Evangeline. They say, what is the best industrial sewing machine for home sewing of personalized cloth bags with leather straps? I know you've made a lot of purses in your day. I have with leather straps too. Um, so industrial sewing machine, that makes me think of like heavy duty, like professional sewing machines. I haven't sewn on any of those, but I have sewn a lot of faux leather bags, faux leather bag handles. I've sewn a lot of layers of faux leather. And this sewing machine works wonders on it. This is the Foff Passport 2.0, um, which is wonderful. I, I recommend it to everyone who will sit still long enough for me to, to yell at them. Um, so in comparison, I had a brother machine before and trying to sew faux leather was, it was just, it was hard. Um, I'd get skip stitches when I'm trying to use top stitching thread and it was just, it was difficult. And when I got this machine, it makes everything seem easy. It just, it's a nice, it's nicely made. It's, it feels heavy duty. It's got the integrated dual feed foot, which is basically a built-in walking foot, which if you've sewn on faux leather or genuine leather, you know, is a huge help to help it glide smoothly under the foot so it doesn't get stuck to the underside of the presser foot. So I love that about it. Um, I've sewn through like six or eight layers of faux leather under this foot and it it's fine. Just make sure you're using a leather needle if you're gonna be sewing through all those layers. Um, if you wanna use like a genuine leather and if you're gonna be doing it a lot, sewing through a lot of layers of genuine leather, you might need an industrial like heavy duty leather sewing machine. Um, but if you're just doing if you're doing home sewing, um, I think something like this is, you know, all you'll need. Um, Cause I've, I've done lots of, lots of purses as you mentioned, and this has worked great. So this is what I would recommend, the Foff Passport 2.0. Absolutely. And I think sometimes those, some of the uh, industrial machines will work obviously for heavy duty sewing, but they may not have some of the cool features that a standard home sewing machine like the one you're using has. Right. So it's like, yes, if, if you know you're absolutely only gonna be sewing this one thing and you only need to do a straight stitch, get your industrial machine. But you know, if you know that you might be wanting to do other types of sewing down the road, you will definitely want something that has, has the option to do that. Yeah. yeah. All right, our next question here, this is from Agnes. And she says, I would love some advice on sewing in circular motions. I am great at sewing along a straight line but anytime there is a curve in the pattern, I cannot seem to sew easily around it. Yeah, so sewing curves, um, it's important to go slow and just make minor adjustments. So um, if, you, if you're sewing along and if you can't really move the fabric to follow that curve, stop with your needle down in the fabric um, my machine has a needle down button, so after you turn it on, you have to press that button. And then every time you stop sewing, the needle will end in the fabric. So end with the needle in the fabric, lift the presser foot, make that small adjustment to, to go around that curve. Sew a couple more stitches, lift the presser foot, make small adjustments. If you make large adjustments, it's not going to be a smooth curved line. You're going to get some points in your, your curve. So just Go very slow and make small adjustments. Absolutely. All right, next question here. This is from Diane. She says she hasn't sewn for over 15 years and would like to get back into it. Um, at the time, she was in between an intermediate to advanced sewer, so where should she start now? Um, probably start in the intermediate section just to to brush up on it and, and see where you're at, and it's all going to come back to you so easy I'm sure all that knowledge is still there even if it's just a little bit dusty once you start using it again it's like riding a bike I think it'll all come back to you so um, yeah just start in you know some intermediate things to brush up um, but then you can uh, speed on ahead absolutely all right a fun one here just because we've been talking about um, how long you're sewing before you change change your needle but here's a fun one um, 
how many hours a day or how many days of the year do you have to practice sewing to become an expert? Uh, I have heard the saying that a thousand hours, I think, of of doing something makes you an expert. But that seems, I don't know, kind of arbitrary. Um, I think just um, doing something and as as you do something, you know, you, you learn more and I don't know, I think expertise kind of sneaks up on you sometimes. It's it's when you, you practice something for a while and, you know, you can do it in your sleep and all of a sudden, you know, one day somebody asks you something and you're like, yeah, da, 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 just do this. And you're like, oh, I can, you know, I'm, I'm an expert at this. So um, I don't know that there's like a certain number that you have to hit to be an expert. Oh, I've also heard you just have to know more than 80% of the people in, you know, in the field to be considered an expert. So if you know more than 80% of the people, you're an expert. I don't know where I heard that, but <laughs> that's another. You might just be making this stuff up. I don't know. But <laughs> Nikki is the expert, so she's allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, mean, I, think, I think it is important to you to know that whether you're an expert or not, or just, I mean, I, I feel like Nikki is definitely an expert in sewing, but I feel like she never stops learning. You're always constantly going to be learning something new, whether it's a technique or a tip or just something that, oh, I never thought about doing that. So like, don't think that you ever have to, you can only get to so much or you, you know, once you learn this much, you don't need to learn anything else. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, there's always more to learn. And, um, it was, 10,000 hours of doing something makes you 10, makes you an expert, apparently. That was the... Yeah. A thousand sounded better, but all right. It's more reachable. <laughs> I know, right? All right. Changing gears a little bit, but here is a question um, about pattern alteration. It says, pattern companies often offer far more ease than is needed in sleeve patterns. In general, how can you take out ease um, in a commercial pattern? Yeah, they offer way too much ease in the sleeve cap. Um, commercial patterns, there's like an inch and a half of ease in the sleeve cap, and you need like a half inch. Honestly, you don't need much. And if you're using a knit, you need like a quarter inch to zero ease in your sleeve cap because it's a knit, it's going to ease in anyway. So to take out the ease from a sleeve cap, um, you want to slash down the center and uh, so draw in the bicep line and draw a line down the center and then cut from the top of the sleeve cap down to the bicep line and then out to each corner leaving a little hinge at the corner and then you can swivel the cap in and overlap you know the edges and you're going to have to true that sleeve cap back so that is you can take out um some ease that way and it's going to lower the cap a little bit but that's you can get some of the ease out um, that way and you can also take some ease out from um, this uh, the underarm seam just bring it honestly just bring it in so if you want to take out like an inch of ease I would do both of those methods and do like half taking out from the underarm seam just bring it in and you know true that down into the to the cuff and then do the slashing of the sleeve cap and swivel that in. So splitting it between um, two areas, you don't want to make too big of an adjustment to any one place on the pattern. Perfect. All right, next question here, this is from Tanya and she says, my daughter is eight and we have made blankets together. However, actual pattern projects are hard due to her attention span. What other projects would you suggest that I try with her? Yeah, so the attention span, got to keep things a little shorter. Um, pillowcases are a great, um, a great project, um, both just like a, like a regular square pillow, just as a throw pillow, but also a pillowcase for your bed. Um, and that's fun. You, you know, they can pick out the fabric and do that together. Um, and... Uh, scarf projects like a little infinity scarf that's a fun easy quick thing to do 
um, what else? Like a, a little tote bag maybe even um, is would be pretty quick. Um, so there's a couple things. I, I have a memory of like one of the first sewing projects that I honestly at this point don't remember if I actually helped sew it or if I just sat there while my mom sewed the whole thing. But it was one of those... Um, it hangs on your wall and it has all those little pockets and I had Beanie Babies at the time and that's what I was putting in there but you know you can just put toys or whatever in there and it has a bunch of little pockets and you'll make it decide how big the pockets need to be because of what toy they want to put in there or something so that could that could be a fun one too but yeah like I said I don't remember if I actually had any part in helping <laughs> make that or not but I remember it so that's always you know what that would be a good one if you remember it from that long ago Oh, that's cute. All right, next question here. No matter what I do to the tension or what needles I use, when I sew with acetates and other lining fabrics, they always pucker. Do you have any suggestions on how to remedy this? Yes. Um, so puckering on the fabric. Um, so if uh, try a, a, a Microtex needle. I know they said that they've tried different needles and threads, but just throwing that out there. If you get puckers, a Microtex needle just has a really, really fine, sharp point. That's great for acetate fabrics. And also a lightweight thread, just a nice fine thread will lay, lay nicer and flatter on the fabric than an all-purpose thread. But also, um, tissue paper. Really glad the last couple minutes of the show <laughs> to get slip that in there. Um, this is a running joke Ashley and I have. Um, <laughs> And to yeah, anyone else who's ever watched any of these ever, <laughs> so. If you've ever heard me speak, you've heard tissue paper come out of my mouth. Um, tissue paper is just a great tool to have around. It's like, you know, it's a, like a lightweight stabilizer for your fabric. It's great. Um, throw it under your fabric layers or even in between. If you've got a slippery fabric, it'll help minimize slippage if you put it in between the layers. But also it helps to... Um, to stabilize the fabric and the thread when you're sewing on lightweight fabrics. So it get just it gives the 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 needle and the feed dog something more to grab onto. It gives the thread something more to to go around. So it just uh, it stabilizes and it's great. And um, after you you sew it, you just you just tear it away and it's great. And even if you're using a zigzag stitch, you might have to go in with your tweezers and pick out the tissue paper from your zigzag, but I've done that before and it's, you know, it's a little tedious, but you sit down and do it and it's fine. Um, so that just gives you a little um, stabilization It'll and it'll give you a nice smooth seam on acetate fabric. So I definitely recommend trying that. So I know we, we've talked about needles and sewing through paper and how paper dulls, but I mean, it, tissue paper is not as thick, but do you think it still maybe affects your needle at all? Uh, maybe a little bit, but it is very thin. Um, it's, it's, you know, the needle not really going through much. That tissue paper is, you know, almost like nothing. Um, so it might dull your needle a little bit, but honestly, I think it's negligible. Um, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't really even factor that into your needle time. Maybe just add a couple minutes, you know, on that clock that I know you have next to your sewing machine, next to yeah. your layers and layers of tissue paper. So Yeah, put five minutes on the needle. <laughs> five minutes on the clock. Go. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you again for being here to answer all of our sewing questions. Um, I hope everyone out there got all our questions answered. But again, if you were maybe watching and and either didn't get your question in or didn't think of one until afterwards, definitely you can always submit questions to us online, on social media. We're always here to help and make sure everyone is furthering their sewing knowledge as much as they possibly can. So thank you again, Nikki, and we will see you again next month. Thank you.